who doesn't welcome the prospect of a holiday when they've been working hard? It's wonderful to be able to get away for a break, to step off the treadmill, to get rested and refreshed. Over the past month, Yvonne and I have enjoyed a week in northern Ontario visiting old friends and nearly two weeks in eastern Ontario reconnecting with our own immediate family. It's been a very welcome break. In today's scripture passage, Jesus and his disciples look forward to a short holiday of sorts. They encounter frustration, but discover when they truly yield their little remaining resources to God's disposal, he can bless and multiply amazingly. Early in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sends out the twelve on a preaching and healing mission. Verses 12 to 13 record that they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Exciting work. Awesome to see God at work helping people who have problems. But it can be very draining work, too. Verse 30, we find the apostles coming back from their mission. They gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. But Mark's next verse gives some idea of the pressure they must have been under. It says, So many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. Oh, they've got to be pretty busy to not have a chance to eat. <laughs> Success causes its own stresses. And say, build a better mousetrap and people will beat a path to your door. What will they do when they hear you can do miracles of physical healing? A marketing expert would probably have told Jesus the last thing he should do at a time like that is withdraw. The movement's just building momentum. But withdraw he does, public demand notwithstanding. Verses 31 on. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, literally a deserted place, out in the boonies, the wilderness, away from everyone. Jesus wasn't captive to popularity. He knew the disciples needed to rest to get away. God is not a slave driver. He cares for our physical needs, our health and effectiveness. Psalm 127 says, In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Matthew 11, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find what? Rest for your souls. That doesn't sound like a slave driver or a harsh taskmaster, does it? Jesus became a human like us. He understands our need for rest when we're exhausted and have been serving him with all we have. And uh, I noted in uh, Chuck Swindoll in his uh, uh, Bible with the notes that he has, He commented right here on this uh, section, Renewal and restoration are not luxuries, they are essentials. Being alone and resting for a while is not selfish, it is Christ-like. Taking your day off each week or rewarding yourself with a relaxing, refreshing vacation is not carnal, it's spiritual. Have you heard Jesus inviting you personally, Come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest? Are you able to unplug from the world's umbilical cord of media and internet to carve out some quiet space with just the master? Can you cultivate the discipline of creating quiet in which you regularly can hear the Lord speaking, addressing you through his word? How regularly do you escape the frenzy and invite God into solitude? Well, vacation plans are great when they work out, but sometimes a ranch gets thrown into the works. Jesus and the twelve were heading by boat to the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee, verse 33 notes. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So when Jesus disembarked, he saw a large crowd. (laughs) Some getaway this turned out to be. Their plan was foiled by their own popularity. Now, how would you have reacted about this point? Would you be pleased to see your holiday plans take this sudden turn? Some of you may have your own stories from this past summer of holiday plans gone awry. For instance, camping outings interrupted by uh, maybe coons beside the tent, garbage cans, or bears, as Allison and 
uh, Cheryl Wilson countered up at Tobermory this past week, or or maybe bees. Our daughter Meredith, her husband Davis, and six-month-old son Malachi were supposed to be flying from Calgary to Montreal and renting a car to go from there to her family vacation west of Ottawa. Great plan. Made a lot of sense. They got to the Calgary airport in time, but there were no more parking spots available in the long-term lot. By the time they got parked, they'd missed their flight, so they ended up flying to Kitchener and busing from there to Ottawa between 10 at night and 5 in the morning. You can imagine a long bus ride in the middle of the night with a six-month-old baby and all their gear. Thankfully, Malachi slept most of the way. Waiting to transfer at the bus station in Toronto, they happened to bump into a member of the Burundian church Meredith had attended in Ottawa. He'd heard they were coming to church that weekend, so he was making the trip especially. That was an encouragement. The bus driver kindly dropped them at the door of their hotel in Canada, where they got a few hours sleep after 5 a.m. before the three-hour Sunday morning church service. That afternoon, other church members shuttled them to a car rental place. Of course, the car they'd booked beforehand out of Montreal was no longer a possibility. The rental company had no cars available that weekend for Ottawa. At this point, we phoned another company that we'd used for Emily and Trent's rental, and they did have vehicles available. Again, church members drove them to the rental agency, and they were finally on their way. In the end, God provided their needs. What could have been a nerve-wracking experience was made easier by the help of other Christians and a thoughtful bus driver. But what a change from their original plans. What was Jesus' reaction when he saw the large crowd? Did he blow up in a rage that their vacation plans were ruined? Did he get back on the boat and head off to another location? Verse 34, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. He didn't blow up or get angry. He had compassion on them. The term means to be moved as to one's bowels. These were thought to be the seat of love and pity. Kind of, his guts were wrenched with compassion, feeling sorry for them. What did Jesus see when he looked out at the large crowd? Enemies or thoughtless bullies who were out to take advantage of a supernatural power? Gimme, gimme, gimme. No, through the lens of compassion, he saw sheep without a shepherd. David McKenna comments, Without a shepherd, sheep are directionless, dumb, and defenseless animals. Directionless, dumb, and defenseless. Of all the animals, sheep are the most vulnerable. Senselessly, they'll wander away from the flock to become easy prey for wolves. Futilely, they will pick over wastelands and starve unless the shepherd leads them into green pastures. Jesus responds with loving care. He becomes their shepherd, teaching them, organizing them, speaking for them, feeding them. What about you? Can you relate to the image of being sheep without a shepherd? How are you like a sheep? Are you directionless? Do you unthinkingly get swept along with the crowd like lemmings rushing headlong over a cliff? I was growing up on a dairy farm. Sometimes the more strong-willed Holsteins in the herd would rub along the fence lines with all their body weight until a wire was broken and then push their way out of the field into the ditch alongside the road. And the more passive cows would follow them out of the safe field into the danger of the roadside. It's not always wise to follow the leader of the crowd, to give in to herd instinct. God provides his teaching so we can resist the pull of natural appetites and desires that could end in our destruction. Well, as Jesus taught the crowds, time passed. In the verses 35 on, the disciples suggest Jesus send the crowds away to the surrounding villages to buy something to eat because it's getting late in the day. It seems the responsible thing to do, perhaps also self-preserving. They don't want an unhappy, hungry crowd on their hands. Things could turn ugly. But Jesus advocates for those who are without the vulnerable. Those who've hurried on foot a long way to hear him, even if they did wreck his plans. Perhaps with a twinkle in his eye, he challenges the disciples. Verse 37, you give them something to eat. The you is emphatic in the Greek. Of course, this stuns the disciples. Such a demand is clearly beyond their meager resources, for the crowd probably approaches some 20,000 men, women, and children combined. Verse 44 is 5,000 men alone. 
Jesus does call us as his disciples to deny ourselves, to say no to ourselves, to take up our cross daily and follow him. Are we truly ready to give up our possessions, our savings and security for a particular purpose if it is the master's leading? If it seems such a short-sighted move as feeding a huge crowd for a day? The petition of the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread, cautions us to rely fully on God rather than feel entitled to security for tomorrow or our later years. Jesus is testing the disciples' obedience level. Are they really ready to give up all their reserves for serving others' needs? I like the way the New Living Translation describes the interaction, as Calvin read uh, earlier. Jesus said, you feed them. With what, they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. 200 denarii in the text being about eight months' wages. Verse 38, Jesus comes back with, How many loaves do you have? What do you have? It's not about what you don't have. Are you prepared to relinquish to the Lord's use the little you already have now? A missionary once asked a new convert, Pablo, if you had a hundred sheep, would you give fifty of them to the Lord's work? He answered, You know I would gladly give them. Pablo, if you had fifty cows, would you give twenty-five to the Lord's work? Yes, you know I would be more than happy to do that. Again, the missionary asked, Pablo, if you had two pigs, would you give one of them to the Lord's work? That's not fair, Pablo replied. You know I have two pigs. <laughs> Many people are extremely generous in theory, but not in practice. They say, if only I had a million dollars, I'd give half of it away. It's simply not true. If we aren't faithfully giving even 10% of our money right now, we wouldn't give away half a million dollars if we had it. Jesus asks, how many loaves do you have? It's a test to see if he's really Lord of all we have and are. What we have may not seem like a whole lot, but have we actually resolved to put it all at his disposal, to put it on the altar? Verse 41, Jesus takes the meager five loaves and two fish, looks up to heaven, gives thanks for a ridiculously paltry amount. It almost seems like a a scene from a Monty Python comedy or something. It's comical, in fact. He, this, this, this five loaves, this huge crowd of 20,000 people. Yet he gives thanks, breaks the loaves, divides up the fish, and quietly, without fanfare, a major miracle occurs. Our limited resources do not limit God. His abundance prevails. Verse 42, they all ate and were satisfied. There were even 12 basketfuls of broken pieces left over, one per disciple. Perhaps God underlining for them that they'd be individually provided for when they entrust all that they have to him. We live in a very materialistic culture where money off makes difference between doing something and not being able to do it. Jesus' words of miracle encourage us to keep offering what we have to God who can multiply supernaturally for his purposes. Our security needs to be in him rather than financial reserves. Lori Cook, a president and CEO of World Relief Canada, shares this story of a couple he heard interviewed on the radio. A young couple lived a wonderful life, wealthy and fulfilled. There was a great standard of living, fulfilling jobs and vacations in the many historical sites throughout Europe. A couple of years ago, they became concerned with the increasing violence and lawlessness in their home city of Karachi. Karachi is the largest city in Pakistan, about 21 million people. You can picture 21 million people in one city. Despite the fact that they'd grown up there and loved much of their life, they looked across to Toronto for a fresh start in more secure surroundings. A safer suburban neighborhood they first moved into quickly became unaffordable and their depleted resources led them to life in a less than desirable part of downtown Toronto. The reality check for these active and ambitious professionals came when they learned that their career credentials were not accepted in Canada. Before long, they found themselves exhausting much of their resources and having to dramatically downsize their lifestyle. 
in their interview, they spoke about moving downtown because they couldn't afford the rent and commute from the suburbs. How they began walking everywhere and shopping ever so carefully for food. But as I listened, Lori says, I sensed that they were not complaining and maybe not even unhappy about their circumstances. They spoke about odd jobs, going home at night, cooking together, sitting and eating, talking and listening to Punjabi radio. Then I recognized why they didn't sound despondent. They expressed a sense of contentment and beyond that even happiness. They discovered a new depth of knowing and loving each other. They also discovered a deep sense of well-being hidden in living a simple life. Several times, the young lady explained how much she felt stronger, more capable, having learned to live without money. She expressed the value of the lesson, how she felt it enabled her. They weren't piously describing an adventure. You could feel in their voices an articulate expression of a deep conviction rooted in a profound experience. Somehow, living without the benefit of discretionary money had transformed them. Lori Cook concludes by challenging us. Let's stop for a moment and think about how much time over the past week we spent in activities that consumed money. But we hadn't had the money, and we couldn't enjoy some of those things. Could we still be alive and well, maybe even weller? Let's pray.